Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Amy Holland, Senior Director of Marketing here at PARC, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the final PARC Forum for 2013. Um, tonight's panel discussion on the age of context. Tonight we welcome co-authors of the book, Robert Scoble and Shell Israel, um, and they're going to start off and give a, a short presentation um, that gives you an overview of the book itself. And then we will be having a panel discussion, also including Park's own Dave Gunning, who's the program manager for our Enterprise Intelligence Program. So he's working on many of the types of technologies that you'll hear about um, in Robert and Shell's book. He sounds like the guy through. who uh, is the real life person of interest guy, right? <laughs> 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 so, um, so yeah, it's a real honor to be here. So thank you so much for coming out and I see so many of my friends in the audience, it's great. Um, you know, I work for Rackspace, which is a cloud computing company, and they asked me to just go and learn about the future and study uh, what's coming next today. For instance, I was at uh, Meta seeing uh, new wearable computers that those guys are building and taking out of the military and co consumerizing. And it's a lot of fun to do that. And so uh, about 20 months ago, 22 months ago now, um, yeah, I can't do that math. Um, I started, it, Shell and I started talking, but even before that I started, I started noticing that there was five separate patterns happening at the same time. And each of those patterns is pretty interesting. But uh, right around that time I started noticing that companies and, and engineers were hooking the five things up together. So let's talk about what the five things were. <coughs> um, I was seeing the number of sensors go up exponentially. You know, I've been going to the Consumer Electronics Show for a long time, and I saw things like the Nest thermostat and light meters and all sorts of garden sensors, and certainly on our phones, we have seven sensors, and if you have a Google Glass, you have another five on you, and, and I'm hearing of investors investing in shirts that are gonna have 14 sensors, and I've seen shoes that have 100 sensors in them. So I, anytime there's an exponential trend in something, uh, it's interesting, and businesses start popping up. Uh, Shell and I wrote a book uh, eight, eight years ago now uh, called Naked Conversations, which is just about one of these five trends, right, social software. And since then, uh, a few billion dollar companies have popped up. We started seeing a new kind of mobile, and really this book is about how the next stage of mobile is really gonna shift a lot of things from cities to governments to health. Right, and I started seeing all these wearable computers. I, you know, just in the last two days, I've seen a couple more companies. But this is uh, Epiphany Eyewear from the two kids from Stanford are putting a little camera inside a sunglass frame. Obviously, Google Glass is the most famous example that most people around the world understand. But uh, this guy is the CEO of uh, Recon Instruments. He's building uh, uh, compute patches for. Uh, uh, ski goggles, like uh, Oakley has uh, his product inside of them. And in fact, I'll pull out one of those Oakleys in a second. <clears throat> I saw the number of uh, the location data was going up exponentially. I, you know, I keep in touch with Dennis Crowley at Foursquare. And even though uh, people say, oh, his company's not going anywhere, his databases are growing exponentially. And the data that he's getting about each place is growing at a very rapid rate, and that's just one company. We have Waze since the book, since we started writing this book, Waze went to uh, Google for $1.3 billion, and uh, on and on. The amount of data about where we are is going up exponentially, so that's interesting. <clears throat> Social data is also continuing to go up exponentially. Um, Twitter today has half a billion tweets a day, and I just had dinner with the head of uh, Twitter product, uh, Michael Ship Sipley, and he says it's just nuts how fast their, uh, their uh, data streams are growing, their databases are growing. And then uh, the force number five is data. And I hate the word big data because it's not just about big data to me. It's about all sorts of new kinds of graph databases that are coming out of uh, the tech industry. There's um, just a, a number of new technologies that have sprung up in the last six years and continued to spring up, you know, the, how many people knew what a Hadoop cluster was, you know, three years ago. Today, many of the com world's companies have one of those, right? <coughs> and uh, 
when, when you add those five things together and you start using them together, then you can build a new kind of system, uh, a contextual system or a context, contextual operating system. In fact, at Google, there's a team building a contextual operating system that is going to go on a phone in the future. And it'll know whether you're walking, running, skiing, driving, shopping, in a meeting, giving a talk, you know, all sorts of different contexts. Because it's, it's doing, if you can already see the precursors of this with Google Now. It's looking into Gmail. And it's looking into Google Calendar. It's looking into uh, our sensors on our phones to try to figure out our pattern through life. And what does this mean? For us as humans, it means two things. It means our products are going to be highly personalized. This Google Glass has my stocks, my airline tickets, uh, my uh, tweets, my pictures on it. Right? It's very, very personalized to me. Uh, and if you get one, I saw one over there, um, it's very pers yours is very personalized to you. And it, when I talk to Oakley and even General Motors, they talk about a car that's going to know you at a very deep level, um, far further than just your seat position. Um, this is, uh, let's see, you've seen the Oakley glasses. That's Scully Helmets, has a little wearable computer in it. Tap and Go is, on, uh, if you go to Santa Clara University right now, you pay for everything on Tap and Go and it stocks you and uh, starts personalizing for you. It also means, the second thing it means is we're going to see a new range of anticipatory systems, systems that are really stocking us at a deep level. That's why our NSA conversation and DARPA conversations are so interesting. If I get to follow you around for a month, I will know whether you go to church or school or strip clubs or uh, what your favorite gas station is, uh, w what kind of food do you like, what kind of food do you hate, who do you hang out with, and on and on. And if I can do that, then I can build a new kind of software that gets ahead of you and suggests things to you to augment your life and improve your life. Google Now is a famous example, but out of SRI, uh, this um, Tempo came out, and it, it looks ahead at, at what I'm doing and tries to stitch together information. And there's other systems uh, coming. Uh, just one, one last week uh, came on my iPad to listen to meetings and do thing, things for me in meetings. Uh, on businesses, it means two things. It means that we're gonna, our businesses are going to study everything about everything. If you think about um, Uber, for instance, he knows where every piece of inventory is, every employee, every customer, every transaction in real time on his mobile phone. And that has deep implications for how we run our companies. You know, at Rackspace, I'm rated every six months, uh, reviewed every six months, and Uber drivers rated every drive. And in fact, by the way, the driver is rating you as well. So if you, uh, if you uh, barf in a car and destroy a car, you'll get a one star and you probably won't get picked up anymore, right? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> uh, the second thing it, it means for businesses is we're going to need to know our, business, our customers in far deeper detail than we did, do today. You know, I just had dinner with the executive team at Ritz-Carlton. And they said, you know, it's funny, when we started the Ritz, when the Ritz started 100 years ago, they used to have a room of index cards, and they would go through your trash even and find out what kind of candy bars you like and how many kids you have, and what, they would write down what kind of wine or alcohol you like or, uh, you know, what, what you like for dinner or do you have some allergies. They would write everything down on that index card, and then when you came back there, they would personalize their service to you and leave that fi your favorite candy bar on the pillow and stuff like that. Freaky stuff in some way, but very high touch, high service in another. And they, they say this is coming back. So let's talk about what, why it's coming back. <clears throat> We're now headed into a world of pinpoint marketing. And Michelle made this term up, which is great. Uh, you know, the old marketing, when I ran a camera store here in Silicon Valley, I had to buy full page ads in the San Jose Mercury News to get to the 100 people who were going to buy a camera that, we that weekend. And it was very inefficient because I'd have to hit all of you to hit the five of you in this room that wanted to buy a camera this weekend. Now that's not true. I, you know, thanks to Google, I know uh, that you're about to buy a camera. I can put an ad at you. But I can also know your behavior of going and visiting camera stores. In fact, that's what Vintank is doing now. So Vintank studies any time you say something about wine on social networks. So if you say, I like Merlot, he builds a profile about you and puts you puts your tweet into a database. He's seeing 1.1 million tweets a day that have something to do about wine, which shows you why exponential numbers are so important. 
When you have exponential numbers, you can build companies like, like Vintank. Shelfworks just won Demo God of the Year a month ago, or two mo a month and a half ago. They're putting uh, these radios into grocery stores, and you tap in with your phone that has a Shelfbox app on it. Uh, it. Really, it has a whole bunch of, I think it has nine different radios that really is stalking you through the grocery store um, in a whole lot of ways. Uh, this guy, this is a prime sense sensor. Uh, Apple just bought them a week ago. Uh, this 3D sensor is so sensitive it can see your hand heading toward a box of Cheerios and do stuff uh, on the screens next to the Cheerios, right? And it can track whether you put that box of Cheerios into a shopping cart. It is amazingly detailed. Right now they're not using it to the utmost extent. They're using it to study shopping analytics and flow patterns in stores, but it's not, it does not take a rocket scientist to see that that technology is going to build a new kind of smart store. Let's talk about how these are built. These are new uh, low energy Bluetooth or Bluetooth low energy beacons. How many people have one of these on, on them right now? Come on. Nobody. How many, people, how many people have an iPhone with iOS 7 on it? Come on. You all have one on you. <laughs> so Android does not do the beacon. Android is about six months behind Apple. In this, in this one place. Uh, these beacons spit off a, a number every uh, second. They run on a coin battery for up to two years, and they cost about $10 wholesale, maybe less if you, you know, buy them for all the Macy's or whatnot. Uh, these are Estimotes, and they uh, just got funded five days ago, um, and they sell for $33 each. But you put these around the store, and as you walk around next to one of these beacons, your iPhone can tell how close it is to one of these radios, and that has deep implications on the future of context and studying these things. So that gives you a little taste of what we're talking about in the book. Um, in the book, you know, Shell goes into deep detail on cities and cars and health and all sorts of fun stuff that we can talk about. Privacy, or lack thereof. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you, you have a big focus in the book. You devote the second to last chapter, I believe, all on privacy. So, you know, where do you think privacy is headed? Um, you know, are, do you think people are even aware no. how lacking they are in privacy? Well, the, the, you know, this is the smartest audience, and I've spoken to computer science, the scientists, you know, audiences like this. Nobody even knows they have a low, to low power Bluetooth beacon in their pocket. And until you understand that, you don't really think about the, where privacy is really going, right? There is this machine that is watching you. <clears throat> if any of you watch television, that's the <laughs> open line of the person uh. of interest. And the truth is that the fiction and the fact are converging very, very rapidly. Um, I think in terms of the private sector, there are things that can and will be done. I think that in the age of context that we wrote the book about, um, pri uh, trust is going to be the new currency. And as such, we will do business with the contextual companies we trust because we have choices. And because those choices, in anything, you take something as popular as Google now, we found, I think, five other companies that are approaching the same issue of creating contextual personal assistant. And most of us will go with Google because we know them. They're a large brand in general. We, we trust them. If they become untrustworthy, we will go elsewhere. We will have choices. So we can tell the companies a few things that we're not getting that we should. Google tells us what they have. They have a privacy page. You can go there and find out what Google's got on you, and you'll be surprised. It's a lot. But we don't have the right yet to say, hey, Google, that's not right. Stop giving me ads for Victoria's Secret because the book Naked Conversations had nothing to do with that stuff. <laughs> and it may be funny, but I don't want a profile that says I have an unusual interest in women's undergarments. Well, I, live on, I live on a golf course, right? And I, a lot of these systems keep telling me stuff about golf, right? And I don't care about golf. So we need the right to correct. We need the right to correct. We also... Fitbit, uh, I, I'll let you, I, I know I just came over you. Fitbit um, 
is a wearable device. Everybody here knows what Fitbit is, right? OK, good. If you wear it to bed, it will measure your sleep. It will also measure exercise, such as making love. And if your cell phone is next to somebody else's cell phone, it will know with whom you are doing it. It will know how long you're doing it, whether you set a personal best or this was <laughs> not your top performance of the week. Some of these people are going to sign up for that app. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. You, you need. I'll you stop right here. Talk a lot about undergarments. <laughs> my, my observation so far. But go ahead. <laughs> Well, this is gonna <laughs> this is gonna affect all the ads you're gonna see tonight. <laughs> you should have the right to turn the damn thing off. We now live in a time when what we're doing is being watched and is being recorded. There is no legal precedent to decide who owns the data, who has access to the data, who can resell or share the data. Yeah. And you need the right to say, Fitbit, shut down. Moto X, don't listen to this. Uh, you know, the Google Glass is the first consumer electronics gadget that knows which way it's aimed. And it has an eye sensor, and it's watching my eye full time. In fact, they just turned on the eye sensor for the first time this week, where you can wink at it and take a picture and stuff like that. But if, you, if I can watch your eye at a oh, pretty sure. close level, I know if you're sober or drunk. Can I tell your employer that, and your insurance company, <laughs> right, and your no, doctor, exactly. right? Does your doctor get to know before your wife does? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is a scary, much scarier situation. You know, right? and not only is it the amount of information you know, but there's multiple providers. It's not just yeah. if there was one, if you just go to the Google page, and that was the one place you could go to figure it out. But now you've got dozens of people recording everything about you. People, ordinary people, won't be able to figure out how to deal with this, right? Unless there's some. If I was at the NSA, change. I'd offer this as a service, right? Well, <laughs> you know, I, I spent many years at DARPA and developed some of the technology that they may or may not be using. Is but it, um, Park has actually developed technology that can detect moods. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, we're doing selling some of that it to stuff, employees. Right. Yeah. So well, it, it, I'm not sure if we're selling it to employees. Market, we, employers, marketing it to employees. I think we That's do things in call centers to, to help people with uh, phones. We have done some right. other work. There was actually a DARPA project on insider threat that can detect people's personality. Can do okay. so if, we're not selling it to them. If I'm an employee, okay, yeah, I yeah, take yeah. it back. I yeah, withdraw yeah, yeah. the statement. Yeah. Are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if, if, if I am employed and my employer yeah. pays for most of my health insurance and right. it's detected that I have uh, fits of rage that are a little yeah. bit unmanageable or that I have early stage cancer, do I get to know or does my employer yeah, get no, to know? That's a good question. I what are you going to monitor? Yeah. It, it, and I will say, I want to go back to the NSA comment. Is that, uh, yeah. Even despite all the publicity and the fact that NSA got a little out of control here, it seems, what they have is nothing compared to what Google and Fitbit and Amazon and right this collection of companies is going to have. And I'm, I think that's a much... And I'm happy about that, to be yeah. honest. I'm very, because I trust Google infinitely more than I trust my NSA. And I have uh, ways that I can have recourse. No, I don't, I don't know, know about that. <laughs> we, about we, that. we touched a the nerve there. <laughs> NSA is not trying to make money by selling you ads, right? That's yeah. it's not that they're being malicious, yeah. right? So I'm just imagining when I have Google Glass, every time I'm hungry, I'll see a brilliant ad of some McDonald's French fries. Now, how how am I going to not gain a hundred pounds when I'm in that kind of situation, right? I think it's. Not that they're being malicious, it's just this pinpoint Well, if you pay $10 a month, they'll show you broccoli, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, so that, they, I, I probably won't eat that, though. That, that was that, actually going to be one of my questions. Right, right. Um, yeah. You know, you talk about people having the right to be able to turn these things off, but where is the economic incentive yeah. for these companies to give you that right if we don't start paying because for Because the some new of the guy will need a way to take us away from Google and other powers that be. Right. So they're going to offer something. And at first, the incumbent will ignore it and talk about how big they are. I have a feeling right. it's going to go the other way, where the new guy is going to give you more free ice cream. You know, Mark Andreessen yeah. said, oh, we're going to That's give away exactly our right. privacy for free ice cream. And, and we have precedent for this, right? Everybody, oh, sure. who doesn't have a credit card in their wallet? 
Not yeah. one hand. I had dinner with Richard Stallman. He had a button on pay cash for everything, stay off the grid kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the credit card was the largest gifting of private information to a, a public company the world had, has ever seen mm -hmm. since before or since, right? And uh, we're all okay with that because we get metaphorical free ice cream. We get protection. You know, yeah. you know if I'm robbed yeah. with $500 cash in my wallet, that's gone. If I get robbed and my yeah. credit cards go away, the bank pays for that, right? Yeah. So right. Um, there's a lot of free ice cream I get for giving my privacy to Visa and MasterCard and American Express, right? Sure. But this is going to be a whole new level, right? This a is whole way beyond anything. This has a nice sensor. Bingo already goes because the credit card knows where you bought and it might see items, right. but Topingo knows what you ate each day. It knows what you looked at each oh, yeah. day. And yeah. they're, they're a new guy, and there's more free ice cream using them, particularly if you're a student right now. Yeah, because <coughs> dad's paying for everything on his but credit the new card. But <laughs> the new guys keep coming up with more free ice cream. And when yeah. the, the big guys start doing things like not letting you have that broccoli ad you so crave when you're hungry, <laughs> right. the, the, then somebody will come along and say, no, we're going to equate your health goals with the ads you get. Would I, you like that? Okay, then you'll leave Google and go there for that service. Yeah, right. Well, so, I think that's the two big problems and, I see. And, and the, the problem is with government, we don't have another government to go to, and most of us still don't want one, although on a bad day, well, I consider I, it. I, you know. I think that's another discussion, but okay. I'm more benign. Than, right? um, but I think there's a problem. One is, is the fragmentation, right? You yeah. could get so much more if all this information was integrated and you had a trusted service that was now going to give you advice. Right, that was good for you, not good for the advertiser. That right? that's starting to, it's it's a long way from being solved completely. Right. But most of the startups I talk to have APIs. Uh, there are new companies like Ift, I F T T T, which are hooking these things together in unique ways. They're not they're not they're yeah. geeky at this point, yeah. right? They, you have to be a little bit of an advanced user and, and right. interested in doing that, but. Uh, slowly, we'll see systems start. So if to somebody could create a service that would do that, and you then get it to take off. Right? I, that's a, I think that's an opportunity if yeah. if uh, the world allows this. But um, we're we're still in the data silo world, right? Uh, my yeah. iPhone has 200 apps on it, and most of those apps don't talk to each other. And Apple doesn't let the apps talk to each other. Now on Android, the apps can actually talk to each other, yeah. and that's why you're seeing some of the contextual apps come out first on Android and then get ported to iPhone. So, hmm. yeah. In the book, you talk about the freaky factor and um, some things being adopted faster than others. Based on your conversations and, and being out in the road, what do you see as maybe the places where some of the contextual um, services will be adopted more quickly? Like, for, for example, for myself, everything you talk about with respect to the car is very, makes a lot of sense to me. Even the self-driving car, because I'd love to have my commute time back. But I know in, in other areas, or for younger kids who are less focused on owning cars, that, that there was might a, not be the big deal. There was a huge shift last year at the Consumer Electronics Show. I had uh, dinners with head, heads of uh, General Motors and Audi and, and uh, a couple other companies. And they finally got a clue that we're not going to spend six grand on the navigation system in the car that we can't upgrade and can't put new things on there. I mean, I, I did that on my Prius, right? Yeah. But I can't put Spotify on my car, right? Uh, I can on my phone. And they're finally getting a clue that the phone is really our center, is going to be our center of our world. And as we walk into the car with the phone, it's going to hook up and going to do things with our phone. And you're seeing that, right? The Chevy Volt now you can turn on from your phone. You, there's an API on the car that you can build apps for. Right. Uh, in fact, a kid uh, that I met uh, built an app for his dad's Tesla with Google Glass so he can say, OK Glass, open moonroof, and it opens the moonroof. Or OK Glass, where did I park my Tesla? And it shows you where it parked and stuff like that. So the, the car itself is, the car companies are finally getting a clue. Mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be another five years before that really works out because the car, the, developing a new car takes right. eight years, it tur turns out, you know, from the day that they start dreaming yeah. about a new car yeah. to the day you get to buy it off the, off the lot. Right? Yeah, pipelines that long. It yeah. That long for they're going to get shorter, but right now they're five to eight years for. Uh, Do you drive with Google Glass? Oh, yeah. Hmm. yeah. No problem, no distractions. 
No, because it's a screen up here on top. It's less distracting than looking down at my nap screen in my car, right? Because then my eyes are down here, totally like off the road. Display, like display. Yeah, and in fact, uh, there's a company I just saw yesterday that's actually building a heads-up display for about $300 for your car that's going to hook into your phone to put information right in front of you on your windshield. And that's, that's exciting, too. So, and that's like a super Google Glass, right? Because the Google Glass is a heads-up display that's right here. Going back to the freaky line, um, it varies by demographic. Younger people are much less freaked out by some of the stuff than people my age or older. Mm -hmm. um, it also is freaky by application. It gets very freaky when something goes wrong. In the book, we talked about Dave Weiner having started a friendship with a woman and mm -hmm. the uh, Google Now just started making certain assumptions and giving him information about her that only a intimate boyfriend would have. Um, well, not quite. That. <coughs> but it, but it told it told him when her flight was arriving, right? It and told him everything he would need to um, know to be a stalker. Yeah, yeah. It, it told him who her yeah. friends were and how to reach them. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would. So that would give it, many people a freaky Go feeling. Google Now even, now, um, it tries to take control of TV. So if you had a DLNA TV up here, it would ask us, who wants to take control of that TV and put something on the TV, right? <laughs> it's really pretty crazy what they're really how aggressive they are in trying to control your world and get ahead of you and assist you. They so. want to know what you intend before you know what you intend, and they're starting to get good at it. That's freaky. Yeah. That is. But it's also useful. It is useful, yeah. but I mean, I think this goes back again to the trust issue. If we think that Google's a trusted source and yet they're stepping over the boundaries, it appears, how do we make sure that? The problem is everybody right has a different boundary. You know, Shell's boundary is here, his wife's boundary is here, and my boundary is way over here, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and our boundaries are moving every year. I will year never a take bit. a shower with an electronic device and allow somebody to photograph me. <laughs> <laughs> and we appreciate that. <laughs> it got 40 million hits. <laughs> That's what you want to be known for, Robert. I'm the Paris Hilton of the or tech shall I call you, Or shall I call you Mr. December? So um, pinpoint marketing, I, it, yeah. it is a great idea, but it's also another area where I felt like well, there could be good and there could be bad. I mean, yeah. what if companies decide that when they know a lot about me, then they can uh, use that information to extract more value from me rather and of than... of course they will. Yeah. Of course they... If you go to the... Uh, even without a cell phone on you, if you go to the, um, uh, the castle up in Napa, Castello di Amorosa Winery, uh, they have a huge castle. It's beautiful. At the front door, they ask you, are you an Instagram user? And if you say yes... They put you on a different tour than if you're my dad, who doesn't know what Instagram is, right? Um, and that is a way to extract more value out of you. You're being tracked into different tracks, into different shoots all the time by marketers, and you don't realize it, but you are. So what's the reason for So you'll take pictures on, on the tour? And Absolutely. Oh, okay. They have a torture chamber underneath the <laughs> castle. And they have a Wi-Fi hotspot and a four-star check-in for that torture chamber. Oh, and okay. they take you down there. And you can take, <laughs> take pictures of your friends being tortured on all this antique torture equipment, right? And that's cool. And it shares their brand with, let's say you have 200 followers on Instagram. Now, all of a sudden, your 200 followers know something about that, that right. castle. And, right. uh, oh, they want to go all of a sudden to nap and go to that castle, right? But good the pinpoint marketing, and back to my McDonald's French fry example. Right, so this is now so good and so precise, they're going to know exactly what your addictions are and feed them, right? Yeah. Is there, I mean, is, don't you see a coming issue with that? I, it's all right here. Facebook is an addictive machine, right? Yeah. And well, it's getting me, better. But, but, yeah, yeah, I, right. I know the guys who write the news feed. Their goal is to addict you to Facebook, to put exactly. 10 things exactly. in front of you that you really engage with highly. And now you've got a 1,000 devices in your world that are all doing that. Yeah. That can't be, that can't be good. Right? It what, can be what, good and bad. <clears throat> what is the danger you see to it? Um, 
what it just like most advertising is trying to get me to do something I really don't want to do or shouldn't do. How much right? of the advertising that reaches you today is well received by you? Not much. Right? Would you say but only hard? because it's not so precise. But it what gets to the point that it, so, so it learns how much I like McDonald's French fries and knows okay. just when to give me that. So ad, right? if you started getting special offers on things that you are interested in at a time you're interested in them, right. in a place where you might be prone to buy them, would that be better for you or worse for you? Oh, I think in a lot of cases it could be better. And okay. people, when they leave, in some cases worse. In, but I, yeah, you know, my, I think in a lot of cases, it my brother-in-law <coughs> got addicted to gambling and gambled away right. two million dollars. So that's right. about that's pretty bad. Um, right. Right. I guess getting addicted to meth would be worse. <laughs> but I think least, that's serious. But gambling's not a bad example. What it's now going to detect but someone you, that's vulnerable to be to gambling. When you have an addiction like that, at some right. point you cross the line from just having fun night in Vegas right. to my family's gone. I've had right. consequences, right. right? That's when you know you're an alcoholic when, or a, a, yeah, a yeah, gambling yeah, yeah. Addic, uh, addict. And at some point when you start having consequences in your life, right. either you fix yourself and go into a program or start <laughs> playing games with yourself to not do what you're doing. Sure. And, you, uh, and, and that leaves business opportunities. For instance, there's this company called Kias that's helping employers reduce the weight of their right. employees. Right. Right. And they are playing games by putting people into eight eight people groups, and if you're yeah, not pulling no, your sure weight, I, I can tell you're not pulling your weight because I'm losing my weight, you're not losing yours, so I'm yeah, going to yeah, bother no, you at work. We, we have a project like that called Fiddle, the same thing. It's social uh, reinforcement as well as advice, right? Yes. So exactly. let's go back to your French fries for a while. But I'm still, but it's, at least you're admitting your addiction to it. <laughs> <laughs> How well, I actually, I almost I never have a similar eat them. addiction, by the way. I never eat them, but I love them. If I'm going to see pictures of them all day. But you know, what will start right. happening, right. It, you know, for example, uh, years ago when Doc Searles first started talking about the intention economy, right. I said, this is cool. And I said, I'm looking for a new refrigerator. And I got a whole bunch of, in those days, we were all on Twitter. And, right. um, I got a whole bunch of people recommending brands and places to buy it. And I, I forget the brand I bought, but it was, of all places, my local Sears that I hadn't been for, yeah. for anything but a tool for a while. Got a great deal, and that was it. You would think. But for the next five or six years, I continued to get advertising right. for right. kitchen appliances, sure. for toasters, dishwashers, <laughs> no, uh, new fixtures well, on my sink. Is, you know, you it, do it, one it, web search on a refrigerator, now you get ads for refrigerators. Retargeting. Right. But, but, right. but yeah, right. the way you go to pinpoint marketing is to know not only when to start sending messages, but to when to stop. Yeah. Well, that could be and that, that would be, be very, yeah, it would be. And it would, you know, it, it's like, this is my favorite, at least. I, I play Lexulus, and I travel a lot. So whenever I'm looking for a hotel in a certain city, I, I put in where I'm looking in a search, and I book my reservations, and that's it. And then for the next three months, I get ads for nice hotels in the place that I just booked. Right. Um, what was right. really interesting is when I went to Cape Cod a while ago, the hotel I really wanted to stay in on a given night was fully booked and I couldn't get in there. So then I did a search, I found another hotel, and continued to get ads from the hotel I first wanted that was still not available on the <laughs> nights I wanted to stay. Right. Contextual advertising would allow current data to keep adjusting so that what you got kept improving. Well, and Google Now is already doing something like this. Um, when I was going to Paris, yeah. it started telling me all sorts of stuff about Paris, the photo spots I wanted to go to, yeah. and you know, uh, yeah. weather and yeah, other yeah. things about what's coming up. And now it doesn't show me any of that stuff. So it it actually has gotten smart enough to turn off of the Paris thing and switch back to my local context because it knows my calendar, it knows where I am. Right. And for the businesses, the, the 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 money changes right now. They're very happy if they get a 2% response on these massive campaigns. They're in Fat yeah. City if they get 3%, which means 97% of us are getting pissed off with the messages we're getting all the time. Mm -hmm. So if they can now calibrate and have lower cost messages going to you when you want them, instead of getting a 2% return, you're going to start seeing 50, 60, maybe a 75% return. And the 25% you don't take Right. really aren't going to offend you because at least they're in the pocket and you, well, you know. One thing I've learned yeah. by being a really heavy social media person too 
is social media is really good at, at satisfying signaling. Yeah. If, for instance, my birthday's coming up, and I'm, I'm starting to signal to everybody, including you, um, I'm going to Napa, and I want to have a great time, right? And I put that on Facebook. And if, it, if the system and all of you help me have a great time, <laughs> God bless it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but you made uh, yeah, the mistake yeah, yeah. of showing that you like the most expensive possible wines there are in Napa. And my plan <laughs> to get you some nice Chianti out of a jug that you can use <laughs> just destroyed. You know, I'm only a writer. Huh? <laughs> I'm still not sure I understand how the system will really take your best interest at heart, You'll, not the interest of all the advertisers. You're going you to right? um, reconfigure what you want out of life. If you, first of all, if you eat McDonald's every day, you're going to get sick, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and people have tried this. They tried oh, yeah, living yeah, off the yeah. Big yeah. Macs and, and mm -hmm. fries yep. for a month mm -hmm. straight, and they actually physically got sick. Yeah. And that's going to get you to go to your doctor. And your doctor, uh, my doctor keeps yelling at me, so I know this happens, right? Yeah. Your doctor says, hey, your cholesterol is too high. Hey, your this is too high. Hey, <laughs> you are. Sure, but somehow, uh, and your insurance company is going to Somehow, if you could control <clears throat> all this data and you had a personal assistant who really had your best interest at heart, you wouldn't have to go through this cycle, though. Right. right. We're in a weird world right. where it's not perfect. And it, right. But why is Fitbit selling? My wife lost 40 yeah, pounds yeah. with her Fitbit, right? right. Right. And that was a way for her to signal to the world I, and to this thing, I want to lose weight and it's causing me problems, so I'm going to live a little bit differently than I did yesterday. So we're going to play games with it. it it's funny, yeah. I, I was giving a talk at uh, Maker Faire, and I, the guy who makes my shirts, uh, Scott Jordan, um, has all these pockets, right? Mm. There's pockets for iPhones oh, and pockets right, for right, right. cords and pockets everywhere. Oh, your everywhere. sensors and uh, whatever. Yeah, right, he's right, thinking right. a lot about <laughs> where the right. future wearable's going. Right. But he was like, I want to build a pocket, and he's working on it, and he's going to build a pocket that is transmission-free. Uh, in other words, you put something in there and it does not transmit to the outside world, <laughs> and which is important, right? Oh, if you're true. in New York and you have the uh, Easy Pass system, uh, the, the, yeah. the RFID tag, um, you might think that's only to pay the toll going through the tunnel. Not true. Yeah. Uh, a hacker just uh, proved that it's being pinged all through the city to watch traffic flows. And I'm sure if you're a drug dealer, you're going to get that data used against you in court, right. Right. on and on. So if you want to stay off the grid, you put that thing in a new kind of pocket. And I give this talk and explain this. And a kid in the front row held up one and said, I have one already. I made it. So we're going to learn as a society how to hack a system and make it work for us. And if it stops working for us, we're just going to uninstall it and we're going to go on with our lives. I have a feeling it's going to work for us at a deep level. And, that's, and I have some examples of that too. Okay. I just have one last question yeah. and then I think we want to open it up to the audience. The, the final thing that occurred to me is, does technology ever get to a point where it knows that we need a break? It, it needs to be off for a while. I mean, we, I work here. Our researchers need to focus. They can't be always You sound on, like my so. wife. <laughs> she's, a, she's always doing these research uh, for our vacations, like where is the last place on earth that doesn't have <laughs> cell phone Wi -Fi. service right, or uh, right. Wi-Fi, you know, like you, you, the, the Yellowstone. Hilton, the Hilton at Key Largo, I was there last week. <laughs> there was no connection. I panicked for two hours, and then it kind of got nice. Yeah. <coughs> no email, yeah. no... F yeah. Yellowstone's like this, right? You get itchy yeah. for a couple hours. It's like, ah, I can't get on, I can't check in, right. I can't... It, you it's know, sort of like when you're without your fries, you know? Yeah, I understand. Yeah. No McDonald's there either, so, you know, maybe <laughs> you know, we should all move to Yellowstone. Yeah. <laughs> Especially for our kids, you know, who, who studies are finding their brains can't multitask and they actually yeah, need to learn to focus. Do you, do you think... To try that, to talk a teenager and it's saying that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, do you think technology will get there, well, where it will understand I, that part of I our well-being? What, what I marvel at about kids and technology is just a, a tick off your question, <clears throat> but I think that in many cases, kids are starting to learn more on the internet than they are in the classroom. Yeah. And they have many more favorite uh, programs that are somewhat good and somewhat bad than they have favorite teachers. And I think that this is an important phenomenon that everybody doesn't want to deal with and say, how should we adjust in that way? Uh, can uh, tech, I, I think what's really sad is even in the best school systems around, the schools themselves are not computer active. They're not using the technology we have, yet we're raising children who are digital children. Yeah. And it's I worse, I, I just, my, my wife ran an education conference a couple of weeks ago and I met 
the superintendent from uh, Illinois, uh, from a rural school in El uh, school system in Illinois, and he, he said, man, it is so hard to get internet into the school. He, even if he could afford the $200 yeah. Android tablets for all the kids, and most schools yeah. can't, uh, getting internet to those tablets is really difficult, and that's why, that's the only reason really to buy a tablet, otherwise it doesn't do anything, right, Tw if you're not on the internet. 12 years ago there was a lawsuit in, I forgot what town in Oregon, um, not far from Portland, where a teacher of eighth grade banned the use of Google in researching papers because it was cheating. These kids should go to libraries. And, you know, that's interesting because I can just see a kid get, uh, going to college, graduating, starting a job, and says, oh, I'll go find the Dewey Decimal System. You know, it, it, it's, times are changing, and as we get older, People my age very often just don't like these changes. It's so hard to keep on, learning. On, on the other hand, I, I agree with most of that. All I have heard uh, people in education say they've gotten to the point to ask the students to write a paper. Yeah. They can go to Google, they can find all kind of source material, but they can't sit down and think through you know, uh, an essay on their own, but you're kind of losing. I'm getting that way, right? Right, yeah. It was hard, uh, I, that's why I got a co-author. <laughs> <laughs> go. I can't sit down and write an essay anymore. <laughs> I love essays. <laughs> There's a math that screwed me up. <laughs> all right, well, we want to have plenty of time for all of yeah. you out there to ask your questions. So I do want to make one other comment. Since he has the 49ers on there, I do want to say go Seahawks before we... Uh... We beat you last time. <laughs> uh, Hopefully we'll get yeah, another chance. You're, you're going to play us under <laughs> different circumstances. It, 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 I have a feeling fun. you're going all the way this year. In the book, I would like to point out that we showed that the most forward-thinking team in the NFL was the world champion, New England Patriots. That's all I have to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> cool, By the way, uh, no Apple fans and baseball is putting low-energy Bluetooth in all baseball stadiums before yeah. next season. So as you walk around with a new watch, maybe, <laughs> it'll do stuff as you walk around the stadiums. Miami Dolphins mm -hmm. doing something that way. Miami Dolphins and Qualcomm just uh, yeah. announced something. I'm seeing it at CES. So this world yeah. is, is happening literally every day. And it, it, you know, this is stuff that we m missed in the book. And the book is, what, only four months old? Well, right. the, the book just keeps going. We just right. don't keep writing it because you would if you could. Probably. It's, it's not a blog, Robert. <laughs> well, that's why I have but, a blog. But <laughs> what? What is going on, and what the book tried to do is not find the answers, but to try to get everyday people to understand what people who are in technology are creating, and to understand that there's good points about it and bad points about it. And just don't freak out, just understand yeah. it and be aware. Humans That's freak out, by the way. I would say it was the most complete picture I've seen of Thank you. coming technology. Okay. Thank you very impressive. much. Yeah. It, you know, it's funny. I just saw a uh, uh, movie on the early cars, early uh, early automobile. Yeah, people hated er early cars. Oh yeah, yeah. there through. would have oh, to be yeah. a guy right. walking in front of the early car with a red flag, warning people ahead <laughs> that there's a contraption coming down the street. Yeah. And so right. we, we always get freaked out by new technology because it's unknown and it, we don't know the dangers of it. Yeah. We, and it, and it, it does weird stuff. I, I've never got it into one of my books, but uh, when I was researching Twitterville, I came across in 19. 1898, I think it was, yeah, 1898, New York Times editorial warning uh, factory managers to never allow a telephone on the premises. Because during company time, people could do personal work, and they could also go to the payphone and share secrets with competitor, competitors. And this was, of course, the New York Times, so it had to be correct. Um, they said if you really needed to put a phone in, you should put it in the, manager, the foreman's office so that the foreman could sit and listen to any personal conversation <laughs> being held. So people don't change, the fears don't change, but the technology is relentless in change. Yeah. That doesn't mean it won't hit a point where it's too much, though. I'm, you know, yeah. I, I'm agree I've yeah. been a you know, technology all my life. You're not going to stop technology. It's sometime right. Moore's, won't stop it, but sometimes sure Moore's good. law has to right. hit a vanishing point. Right. We, now that it's proving its way into yeah. nanotechnology, it's going to go for another you know, 20, today, 30 years again. Right. Today I was hanging out with uh, the, the guys who started Meta, uh, which is a really crazy company up in the hills uh, in a mansion. And Meta is a wearable computer with 3D sensors facing forward so you can do stuff with your hands. Yeah. And uh, two... Uh, 720p glasses. It comes straight out of military. He used to be a jet fighter pilot. 
And he says what's driving him and his company is the science fiction, is the fact that people uh, you know, yeah. watch Tony Stark and Iron Man, and they want that yeah. kind of interaction, right? Yeah. We're getting a couple takers. We'll get I'm, the mic going around. I'm one of those people in technology you were referring to. And uh, I wonder if we could get a little more technical. Could you uh, uh, give us some ideas on what you consider to be challenges, needs, problems in the technology of all of this? And uh, don't ignore the software part of it. The data flows. The data flows are, uh, are, are outstripping most corporations' ability to keep up. You know, uh, eBay has a 20,000 node Hadoop cluster to run its search engine, but it, it, eBay has you guys to hire from, right? And has the resources to do that. If you're at the Ritz Carlton, you don't have a set of five PhDs who are data scientists who know how to set up that system and keep it running and, and, make, and see some pattern out of it. Every business is being forced to have a Hadoop cluster now, or something similar to it. Uh, Union Pacific is putting sensors underneath all the tracks. It's seeing 40 million hits off those sensors already per day, and it has to build a data system to see the patterns of that and manage the trains, right? That's, it, it, um, I don't think it's a problem for the people in this room. It's a problem for everybody else, and there's opportunity to build businesses that simplify what you guys can do as rocket scientists and uh, make it so that well, the Ritz can build it. I think their challenges are building richer models of the person and being able to do this pinpointing. Right, yeah. you kind of have kind of fairly first generation of machine learning stuff that's just scratching the surface of that. Yeah. I'd expect there's a lot more to be but done. How hard is it for Park to hire somebody like that? Oh, geez, what? Hard to hire them, hard to keep them, you know? We have yeah. them. We have them locked in the basement and don't allow them to get to a telephone. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm an essayist. Uh, does that help? <laughs> no, it's, uh, you know, at, at, at the startup, they, they have three people they stole from Google, right? Right. And uh, with, with equity, a ton of equity and a dream of building right. the future. And there ain't that many of those people. Yeah, I, I visited exactly. a ton of startups. These are rocket scientists, right? Oh, yeah. And to, to what, what we need is businesses built by rocket scientists who make it easy for people like me to do it as well. I know people like my wife. Right. Well, that's even yeah. first that's you got to get to me. Comprehension. <laughs> yeah. um, we so have a question the, down here. Yeah. In the, in the heart of Silicon Valley, yeah. with such a great panel, asking anything controversial is a little bit, you know, it's challenging, but let me ask you two questions. Number one, there was a judgment by a federal court which sort of outlawed, uh, or at least said that it is unconstitutional to listen to the phone calls. Well, it's in play. Right? It's in play, exactly. Yeah. And Supreme Court judgment of 1979 stands and there is a wide belief that it would get overturned. Yeah. In case it doesn't get overturned because technology has um, you know, improved dramatically. Do you expect that it could have an impact on the advertising industry in any way? And two, the That's idea, uh, let me just finish the second yeah. question so then you can take off. Um, the sec second question is a little bit controversial. The massive amount of cooperation that has happened between the government and between corporate America, prison program and other things, point to a situation that where there at least is a potential for massive abuse of power. Do you address these issues in your book? A little bit. I'm not, uh, you, know. you know, we we began writing this book because Robert saw all these cool things that are coming along. And we had no intention of dealing with issues like David Manning and Edward Snowden the Boston uh, Marathon, um, these were the elephants that kept getting into our book in every chapter. Um, we tried, as I tried to say a couple of minutes ago, to lay a groundwork so that people became aware of what was going on and what the issues are. Uh, the resolutions of these issues are really not where you should turn to Robert and me. I'm a journalist and a recovering uh, publicist. Uh, Robert is a tech geek, and there are overriding Marketing journalist. Yeah, there are overriding global human issues going on. 
the relationship with humans and technology is getting better, worse, and more complex as we speak. And no, we didn't really go to any depth to either of those issues. We hope that others follow us and do. Yeah. It's the same question this, this you guy asked about. Here is trying real uh, hard yeah. to ask a question. <laughs> yeah. right. get, yeah. get a mic yeah. up here. But, well, yeah. Yeah. No, one no. up here, then we'll, then we'll get you. Because he was the first one to raise. Right. We'll get we'll get right. you. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No. Uh, hi there. Uh, but it gets back, just for a second. It gets back to your question about technology. I'm not a technologist. I don't write code. I'm not a material science. My that's my dad. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I I can translate that to English, but I'm not I, I'm not the guy who's going to tell you uh, what he can or can't do. And in fact, I. Even hanging out with Meta, I keep asking him, you know, what can't you do that you want to do? And he wouldn't answer the question. Because I don't know <laughs> that he even knows that, right? The guy who started Pixar Films said he knew uh, 10 years before he could do yeah. a digital film that he, he, he knew a digital film was going to be possible, but he had to wait for Moore's Law to flip 10 times before it made it possible. And then all of a sudden he could make his movie, right? It's the guys that invent this stuff do it because it's cool. They do it for the same reason that whales jump out of the ocean, because they can, and because nobody else ever did it before. And the best way to get a really good technologist going is to tell him it can't be done. Tell her or him it can't be done. So I paid a lot, a lot of attention to the use of technology for disabled. And um, I see tremendous potential for augmented and wearable technology. Things are starting to happen. Including right? AR. And yeah. I get in a lot of arguments with people. I'm an early wearable computing pioneer. I built my first wearable in info system in, in the early 80s wow. to manage guest lists at VIP nightclubs. So the, for, just like you were talking about the Ritz, so the clients feel like they're really being handled like celebrities when they go in to make that a very quick process. Yeah. But it, that's a social app. But I, I shifted now, and I'm like the believer of the, of the fact that if you have a cognitive disorder, if you're getting older and your memory's failing, that this technology is going to get better and better and better at serving you where you're going to be just as sharp and just as smart as a 20-something that's uh, you know, eating ginkgo bell boa for breakfast. And when you walk into some place and somebody says, no, you can't wear that in here, or you, you have to take that off, that there's going to be federal ADA protection that does not give them the right to insist that you take that off. And, and it's going to be like the Segway is a mobility aid in California. It's ADA mm -hmm. protected. Um, you've probably thought about it. You've already looked at applications for facial blindness and other stuff like I that. I met a guy who was wearing an exoskeleton and was paralyzed, right? Yeah. Right. So t tell us what you think about uh, as you get older and you and other people who might never adopt the technology adopt it because it just becomes necessary in the world we live in and it really is helpful for them. How do you feel about other people feeling spied on, not wanting you to wear it or have a camera on you someplace? How Can do you I feel answer that first and then... I, I've been wearing this for seven months straight, and I've never you didn't been. Wait for my answer. I know, but I've never been asked to really take it off. But once in a while, people uh, start asking pointed questions like, "Are you taking video of me?" And particularly when you go through passport agencies and stuff. But I had one at a nightclub at a concert ask me that, a security guard, and said, "You got to take that off." I go, "Are you forcing that guy with a smartphone to turn off his smartphone?" He goes, "No, he he's not taking video." I go, "How do you know that?" And, well, I can watch his screen. And I go, well, you can watch my screen, too. And I let him try it on. And I explained how to see whether I was recording or not. And then he calmed down. And by the way, he got really excited at that point. And he called all of his friends over and said, you got to try this on. It's so cool, right? Uh, we're going to change as we get used to things. I got yelled at for using a credit card in a Starbucks when it was first coming on, online, right? And now it's like everybody uses credit cards in Starbucks, right? No, let, let him get in here because well, he's... Yeah. Just very quickly, that uh, one of the great surprises in the book was the pervading influence of technology in helping people with chronic, serious, and terminal diseases get better. Uh, devices that let Alzheimer people walk around within a certain geofenced area, but alarms go off when they step out of it. Sensors on tattoos that allow quadriplegics to, uh, to, to have their body functions pr constantly monitored. Um, and it goes on and on and on. We, we, we met a teacher. Uh, 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 um, Asthmatics. A, 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 
asthmatics who, who na now, the, there's a sensor on, on the breath light, what do you call it? Uh, breath, breathing device yeah. uh, that shows where asthmatics inhale all the time. And then it creates a hot map for a city. Chattanooga, of all places, is a leader in this. And they report where, ch uh, where, where asthmatics should not go in the city because these are dangerous. In New York, a, a, a little bit of research. This comes from a Redwood City company that was called Asthmopolis that just got a new cooler name that I can't remember. But in New York, they discovered that asthmatic children were all inhaling on the same walk to school every day. They discovered it was within uh, the parameter uh, uh, of a uh, refinery. So they had the kids walk one block away, and that was an entire school, I think, there were 42 asthmatic children. Mm -hmm. Two sniffs a day, every day for the rest of time. Multiply that. You know, you get so many things happen. We, 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 we didn't talk to a lady, but there was a lady who had no hands who had a robotic hand developed by the MIT Media Lab, which she got to operate on brain waves. What she did with it was kind of cute. She ate chocolates with it. Um, but the point is, all, there, there's Jesse, the, the, uh, the lineman for, from Tennessee, who, who um, got 50 zillion watts of, of electricity into him, lost, fell off the pole, lost both his arms. He got these new robotic arms, the robotic prosthetics, I guess they're called, with an artificial skin that are sensor enabled so that he feels in his heart, literally in his chest, when his wife holds his hand. He also feels heat on it. And the only problem is he keeps feeling when it's hot that the sweat on his robotic arm, but there isn't. And this is just stuff in the last three, four years. What's going to happen in the next three, four years? I am so hopeful in this area. And the other thing that's interesting, this is technology people and doctors, that's it's not point. healthcare. Yeah. I'm going. <laughs> You're well, telling me to hurry up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, can we have a vote on this? <laughs> Let's ahead. just get two more questions. Okay. This, uh, is, uh, this is sort of a generalization of sort of the prior question, but in terms of the quantified self movement in ter and uh, medical devices and things like that sort of for the general population, what have you seen? Where do you see that going in the near term is my question. Well, uh, I think it's going to grow out of the geeky world and into the everyday world. Uh, if, you're, um, if you uh, fly the president around, you're wearing a, a fatigue science bracelet that measures your sleep cycles. And so they know that you've had enough sleep to fly the president around. And those, those bracelets are being worn by athletes at, uh, at the 49ers and uh, minors now. So your, your employer is sort of almost mandating that you wear this thing to study safety in a new way and make your life better. Uh, and you're going along with that because it is making you safer and you don't want to die today because you didn't get enough sleep last night. Um, and soon we're going to have patches. We visited an RD lab in Ireland that makes uh, micro needles out of silicon and that pull a few cells of blood out of your skin. And we, I put my finger on it. It felt like putting my finger on sandpaper. It felt OK. But you know, I'm if a you're diabetic. I have these little black dots on all my fingers, and this will go away because of what can be on the market in the next two or three years. And I, I just want to go back over here for just a second. I really don't care if people are uncomfortable with ectoskeletons or other things that are freaky to them. If it's allowing somebody who's had to stay in the confines of a room to go out and have something closer to a normal life. Um, I, my wife got injured in, in, in Hawaii one time, and I had the brief experience of wheeling her on a wheelchair um, through an airport where people just walked right in front of her because people in wheelchairs don't seem to exist. And, and that's a long time memory, but since then, every time I see somebody in a wheelchair, I always make sure I get their eye contact and I say hi. Right. And it's amazing the difference because we not we, but many, many people in, in, in our society who are supposedly open-minded seem to be damn prejudiced against people with physical impediments. And I think that that's just too bad for them. Yeah. How do we combat the uh, rely, teenage, teenagers' reliance on um, technology? Uh, I'm 16, and... Uh, 
And um, recent, oh, just today for my physics lab, uh, I kind of neglected it because I know I can find the answers online. <laughs> and uh, <Yeah. laughs> and I and when I go online, I find myself drawn to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, <laughs> where I'm spending most of my time photoshopping so I can get more likes or yeah. tweets about it. <laughs> um, it's it's not. I mean, it's fun, but um, it's not helping me to learn anything. And then I feel like my you might think that. Yeah. But I, I I drove my 19 year old son today from the airport and to Meta. And he was pissed at me because he was like, dude, I have to go home and send in my paper. I go, first of all, you have an iPhone. You do it from the car here. You know? But <laughs> the first thing he wanted was a hit of Wi-Fi so he could send his final term paper in on time by 5 p.m. today. But we were uh, trying to get him a, a rental place for the last week. And these guys were really, really uh, ripping us off and being rude. And it's like, dude, I have 600,000 followers on Facebook. Think about what you're just about to do. Do you want me to talk to uh, XYZ person in Mayor Bloomberg's office about what you're doing to me? And all of a sudden, the tone changed. <laughs> so the net and kids know this. Uh, you know, people know this in, in, who are kids. The networks you're building are power instruments. Are going to get you jobs in the future. You know this because every time you're laid. I know this by watching people on LinkedIn. When they're laid off, what do they do? The first thing they do, they don't even tell their wife. They go to LinkedIn and start updating their <laughs> resumes, you know, updating their stuff and making sure it's all accurate so that when they start calling their friend for a job, uh, that everything's accurate over there. And in fact, my friends work at LinkedIn, and they said that's how we know <laughs> that somebody's going is in job, uh, you know, in job jeopardy. Because when, when you start getting threatened by, by your boss or in a bad situation, the first thing you do is start updating your LinkedIn. I have something to say. Yeah, go ahead. I, I have two observations to you. How did you know to come here tonight? You, you're surrounded by people with PhDs and higher. <laughs> and you're a 15-year-old guy, Six and all you do is flitter your time away on Facebook. How did you know to be here? Oh, um, it's part of my physics grade. Uh, for, oh, I have to go to a seminar. But my I think it's worth worth acknowledging there is an issue that you can't concentrate as easily. You, you, you should be doing right? homework right now. Yeah, 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 no, yeah, my yeah, second yeah. question to you is: Do you feel you learn more online or in the classroom? Um, actually, I found I learn more on my own. Maybe like, yeah, online, also in class as well. But were we any different? Well, I wasn't. I, I I had one of the highest SAT scores, I, and I had D's I, in class, right? I, I, and my my counselor yelled at me. I would still remember that. He goes, "What the fuck? How did you do this? How did you get such a great score on SAT and you didn't go to class all the time?" I go, "Because I I went and asked the guy building the sewer line out in front of the, you know, how to how how to right. work a." A measuring device, and I learned trigonometry from him, not from the teacher. I, I, I learned math because I needed to follow batting averages. Except as a Red Sox fan, I always had low numbers to look at. <laughs> but 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 I think that you're arguing the case for the book that everybody's urging me not to write. Huh. I think most of us learn things outside of the classroom that we're supposed to be going to school to learn. Most of us were bored by most of the books we read and teachers we had. And all my life, we've had these wise people talking to each other about how to improve the classroom, make it open, make it smaller, make it bigger. Done it. And the truth of the matter is that we have things like the Khan Academy now, where, where the smartest people in any topic in the world have the ability to, to teach everybody in the world, and everybody in the world has the ability to learn at their own pace and their own comfort. And I think it's time that we start looking at these two things. There's a lot of hands that just shot up then. Yeah. <laughs> In order to give everybody time to interact with you, uh, well, afterwards we'll take one we'll more stick question here. I'm not going home. And then we'll, Thank you. we'll break and we'll, we'll let people. Yeah. Aren't we here until 6.30? No, actually, the, the 6 to 6.30 is supposed to be networking and having. Good I've been work. having a ball. Okay. <laughs> how, many of, how many of us want us to sit down and sh well, we're sitting down. How many of us want us to shut down? Can I ask one question? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 There's one. 
Uh, we'll we'll stick around. I, we oh, know who we you are. <laughs> we'll yeah. stick around. Can, can, Remember, you want to sell some books, guys, though, uh, too. Oh, That's his oh, 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 never mind. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> well, they can just do it online. They yeah, exactly. Well, go, go to Kindle. Yeah, oh, you can. I got 300 books. Oh, oh, You're taking oh, away okay. his one minute that he has left. Come on. So uh, one thing that maybe isn't covered in your book, I'm not sure, but it, you say context, but I think it's almost sometimes the age of non-context. So for example, 23andMe, you know, offers a lot of genomic mm. data. I work in the medical and health data space, yeah. and there's a lot of information that has absolutely no context. So when I look at my yeah. genome, if I did, uh, and I would have no idea what I'm looking at, and someone who's providing this information may have not the proper context, they may make life and death decisions. So this is not just about that particular issue, that, that example, but in general, I think this is coming up a lot. Uh, Thanks for my my yeah. friend, my friend Andy, uh, who lives near me, was one of the ten guys who built the iPhone. And he's thinking about this a lot. And I did he design the slides? No, no, that's the, that's uh, Bill Bill Bolt. By they the look, way, they look good. I mean, yeah, I would have liked to have seen him yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Bull did, uh, took my slides and made them look pretty. <laughs> so he's the guy who uh, designed the iPad, <laughs> iPod. I'm sorry. Um, and we walk around and we we say the internet right now is uh, the way it views the world is that it's a crude world. There's a piece of data here, a piece of data there, and it just doesn't have good. Uh, it's not like us. I can look at you and see a lot of HD, high high quality data that the computer can't yet see, right? But in 10 years, uh, it's going to be a sharper world to the internet. The internet's going to have a ton more data about everybody sitting in this room. And I'm hurry up, we got books to sell. Ah. <laughs> yeah. That's your problem, yeah. not mine. <laughs> well, I got, I got the sponsorships. You got the book sales. Over here. <laughs> so I, I, I think every year this is going to get better. It, yes, we are in a crude world where this world has no context today, or very little. And every year it's going to get better and better. And I think we write books that have a 10-year uh, impact. Right? Our first book was eight years ago about social. And it was before Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn really became popular. And, and I think that's what we tried to do is get ahead of people a little bit and try to get you guys thinking about what kind of world this should be. You know? One more question. Yeah. How, how about two more? One right here and yeah, one, yeah. one okay. over there. So hey, guys. It seemed like. Oh. I don't know where we are. Oh, there, so, oh, there, hey, oh, there you are. Hey. Okay. Hey guys, it seems so. I, I think a lot about engineering, a lot about uh, design, and a lot about psychology and behavior specifically. Yeah. It mm -hmm. seems like some of the conversations we like, heard earlier tonight were about what do companies let us do? What do um, if they allow us to do this? Um, if they uh, give us this right? And I was curious, it seems like this conversation is framed around choice. Like, do we have the choice to do X, Y, Z? Um, does the technology allow us the affordance to do something? And I was wondering, to, I, I just want to flip the frame um, and ask, well, do you see any technologies recently that allow you to, um, let me see if I got phrase this right, uh, that empower your ability to choose, that empower your ability to think? I, I get this a similar question. Let me see if I can rephrase your question and see if it's right on point. Uh, if these systems go, get so good, they're going to tell us what to do, what to eat every night, and where to go every day, and, and our self-driving car is going to know where to take us and not going to give us the choice, uh, and we're going like, to like that. Like, uh, if I went to the Ritz, and the Ritz knows I like Oban whiskey, I'm going to get Oban whiskey every night, right? Is that where you're thinking? And so I don't, do I really have the choice not to have Oban whiskey anymore? I'm going to flip it back in one more way. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. It's a great question. It's a great question. But, but, but I, let, let, yeah. let me. Go Robert, ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. To me, choice is the sacred part of the human animal. And I don't want the machines to make the ultimate choices. I want the people to make the ultimate choices. I haven't seen technologies that take that away, but I am rather certain that will come. 
And I hope that becomes the point of resistance. That's the point where people say, no, I won't opt in. And I hope that we have the choice to opt in or not opt in. It sounds like in a way he's saying, can he expand his creative thought, not just be Here's given a bunch of choices, right? Is there, is there some way this technology can I, work in that I way? used to memorize phone numbers. Yeah. I still remember my childhood's friend's phone number from yeah. 30 years ago, uh, even though I haven't used it in right, 30 years, because it's locked in my brain somewhere. Yeah. I don't need to do that anymore because my phone right. memory, I don't even know my wife's phone number to tell you the right. truth, yeah, right? Because my problem. wife is a right. name on right. my iPhone and I can ch click right. on it. And that has freed up my brain to do other, other things, things right. or maybe kill a few brain cells tonight with some Obon whiskey, right? <laughs> right. Uh, which, by the way, as long as there is alcohol, there will be choice <laughs> because we're going to... We're going to take ourselves off the rails of where we thought we were going to go. The and views of the co-author <laughs> are not necessarily those. Never mind. And, oh, yeah. and it's, it's our friends who are going to have a different experience or a different path through life. And when we People get together, they're going to they're gonna pull us o over to the new experience. And we're always looking to increase our experience, even if you eat at a... Even, like Guy Savoie. I, okay, I've been to Guy Savoie now in Paris, which is a great restaurant. Now I'm looking for a better one experience. Question, okay, Robert. one, one more question up here, one and then we'll let everybody. So his question was sort of, we didn't team up on this, but it's, it's a version of what he just said, um, but I'll tilt it a little bit. So this 16-year-old who came and said to you, I would rather come. Congratulations, you know, happy birthday. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit distracted, et cetera, and so I, you know, I came to this talk because I kind of had to. And basically, he was worried a little bit, rightly so, about critical thinking and also learning in the classroom because that mm. is where kids still learn. So yeah. how, do you, how do you write the two things that you're talking about? So one is contextual learning that's forced upon you, really, by anybody writing code, right? Anyone using the internet, you get kind of forced into it. Well, you do, because kids have to, quote unquote, have to be on Facebook and Twitter in order to know what's going on. And you're saying learning in the classroom is a bad thing. Is it really? And did you learn in a classroom? And did you suffer from it? Uh, I'll, I'll go on two parts. One is I very fundamentally disagree with the first statement. Uh, at best, Facebook has 1.3 billion people. There are over 7 billion in the world last time I looked. That means there are an awful lot of people who are having perfectly good or otherwise miserable lives without being on, not having a cell phone yet, never mind a smartphone. So, and I would also argue that those that are on it are having richer lives for the experience. Then the second part of your question was, could you repeat it one more time? So basically, I'm trying to figure out how you can play both sides. On the I, one side, you're telling him school, eh, not so much. I learned about math to, from the sewers. I, schools I am, are starting to change. They're, <coughs> they're, they're even calling it at the education conference, flipping the education process. I would hate to see learn, it. Where you learn at Khan Academy at home in the evening, and you come to school to do the homework with somebody who can help you right. get over the challenge of what the work is. Yeah. I, I, I think the question was addressed to what I said earlier, and at no point did I say I'd like to see the classroom ended. Yeah. I just think that for years we've been tinkering with what we have in the status quo, and I think it would be a very good idea to rethink it and embrace the fact that, that the modern world has moved into a technology world while people get, a, get voted onto school boards because they'll cut budgets. Teachers uh, worry more about tenure uh, and making sure that they make the state uh, state so tests, uh, they, they score well enough on the... So and parents, and parents the these days go into classrooms and tell is, teachers what to do. Have you been there lately? Kids the, can't, they have no, no chance of doing critical thinking. That's absolutely not true. Absolutely. Do you have come kids on, in school? Come to school with me. I have, I have three kids, six, four, and 19. Okay. That's not true at all. I mean, come on. Absolutely true. Yeah. Okay, and that's how we Anyways, go. We're, let's go sell some of <laughs> We're, we're way off topic of context, so thank you very much. Thank you, Sal. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank you